Kenny was walking Yekaterina home when Bruce called back. Oh, hello, Pastor, he said. Actually, now I can't talk. Oh, she's right there, Bruce said. How'd you know? Why else would you have called me in the first place? A couple of reasons, actually. I'll call you later, Pastor. Pastor? Yekaterina said as Kenny finished. What pastor? Oh, just an old friend of my parents. Bruce? Kenny blushed and nodded. I want to get an outside opinion on what I should do about the Jospins. That seemed to satisfy Kat, and they spent the dinner hour with her parents, talking openly about their future. Nothing was official yet, of course, but their conversations had progressed even to the logistics of where they would live. Kenny wanted to make his actual proposal something dramatic and special. That night, Ramey called a meeting of the Millennium Force, and it was clear Zaki wasn't happy. You still pining over your buddy, Ramey said. I don't get it. All of us except Kenny here have glorified minds, and you're still obsessing over what I had to say to Kasim. Zaki shook his head. I felt ganged up on, and I know Kasim did. I want to go on record that you overreacted and that you had no right to ban him from our meetings. He didn't belong here, Bahira said. He was never a member, and Ramey made it clear he wasn't to even pretend to represent us, but still he did just that. He called himself our tall infiltration expert. He was just trying to help. Kenny remembered when these meetings had been positive and consisted mostly of prayer for the undecideds they so longed to reach. I can't stay long tonight, he said. I have a call I need to make. But you suggested this meeting, Ramey said. I know, and I appreciate it. I just think we need to get off the subject of Kasim and talk about what you all think I should do about the Jospins. It's time to act, Zaki said. You've got a chance here to really get next to them and find out what's going on. One more delay or misstep and you lose all credibility with them. I can't argue with that, Ramey said. Bahira? Much as I hate to agree with my brother... Hey! Kidding! I agree it's time to act. Guess that means a green light from us, Ramey said. Be careful and keep us posted. Of course, Bruce said. Kenny, I would be honored. And I agree, it's a nice touch tying your wedding to that of your parents. But you must get Yekaterina on board. She may have another idea. It has to be her call. I won't be offended either way. While they were connected by their implanted cellular phones, Kenny filled Bruce in on the situation with the other light in Paris. What's the benefit compared to the risk, Kenny? What is the upside for the Millennium Force? Knowing what they're up to, being able to counter what they say before they say it. We're not afraid of them. They're not going to hurt us or any other believers. Our mission, our target, is the undecided. As long as it helps accomplish your mission, I'd say go for it. Monday morning, after Abdullah had stepped out to fetch the treats for the two young men, he asked Mudawar if it was all right for him to chat with Sarsour on his break. Why are you asking me? He spends a lot of his work time with you anyway. But sure, fine. You know this is a joke. A believer, a member of the opposition, officing here. It's silly when you think about it, but I'm not amused. Fact is, really, I'm taking advantage of you. Besides learning a few things and being able to better articulate our position, I'm keeping you from more important duties, keeping you from the very hearts and minds we're trying to reach. But don't expect me to let you sit there in all your glory when we have visitors. I am surprised I haven't seen any yet. For what purpose do they come here, and why have there been none? They come for monthly strategy sessions, and sometimes we get visitors from chapters in other parts of the world. Your presence when they arrive will be verboten. And when will that be? Nothing is currently planned, but believe me, it'll happen. Kenny, Chloe said, 
I decided to call both of you in because I know you'll tell Yekaterina anyway. He and Kat looked at each other. Tell her what? Chloe spun the note on her desk so both could read it. Yekaterina said, Oh, for the love! Good grief, Mom. Really, why do you even waste your time on stuff like this? You know how ridiculous this is? I'm in love with this woman and plan to marry her. I would no more do her harm than I would harm myself. I know. I'm sorry. I just want you to know what I'm dealing with. Can you think of anyone who would want to stir up this kind of trouble? Only Kasim, Kenny said, and Maddie claims he's turned over a new leaf. It's true, Kat said, nodding. He's been a perfect gentleman ever since I started my new role, and I don't think he's faking it. He doesn't disappear when we need help anymore. He seems to go out of his way to pitch in. How about the spiritual part, Chloe said. Does he seem any more interested in talking with kids about the Lord? I can't say that he does, but then we don't get that much opportunity for that in Rec. Plus, now I think people sort of leave that part of it to me. Which is all right with me. It just gives me more opportunities. Yes, Chloe said, but evangelism is what we're all about. It's why we're here. I want people working for us, even in your area, who care about these children's hearts and souls. They sat in silence for a moment. Finally, Kenny said, Let's just forget this other mom. It's not worth the time, really. Chapter 24 Abdullah had Yasmin's permission to show her letter to whomever he felt it necessary, but already he was repenting of promising to show it to Sarsour. It was so personal and, frankly, so painful. And yet, if it could somehow turn a stubborn heart toward God, he didn't have a choice. When he and Sarsour were sitting across from one another again, the young man's countenance and demeanor had reverted to their first days together. What is troubling you, son? I don't know, Sarsour said, his mouth full of his snack, and his tone evidencing that he did, in fact, know. It's only fair to tell you that, so far, you have not changed my mind a whit. You're a curiosity, and I like a good story as well as the next man, but don't start thinking you're getting to me. Fair enough. But it is not your mind I care so much about, Sarsour. It is your heart. That is what God is after, too. You sound like my parents. They know your mission, your work. The young man shook his head. It would be cruel to tell them. They know I'm not a believer, that I have a lot of questions and accusations against God. That hurts them enough. I don't need to nail the final lid in their coffin. They are not the ones who will die, son. Touché. But it is true. They entered the kingdom redeemed of the Lord, and while they will age because they are naturals, they are promised eternity with God. They will be ushered from this kingdom to the next. How old are you, Sarsor? The young man shrugged. Come, come, everyone knows his own age. I'm two months younger than Mudawar, and he is nearly a hundred. Sarsor, please, we have no time to waste. You boys must come to your senses, come to the Lord. Consider all this foolishness, just youthful independence and rebellion, but turn now to what you have to know is the truth. I know nothing of the sort. Listen, let's say you're right. Let's say that despite all you tallers dying off at the end of your hundred years, you are somehow able to keep this torch burning down through the centuries as the population expands. By the last century of the millennium, you have amassed this great army. And, all right, let's say that against all odds and logic and prophecy and the very word of God, your side prevails. Let me postulate that those of you who thought this up and schemed and strategized are still dead and still in hell, and that your leader does not have the power to resurrect you. Convince me I am wrong. 
while Lucifer would be returned to his rightful place. He would be the king then, in charge, on the throne. And he would inherit the powers of God himself? Sure, why not? Because it doesn't work that way. If he was almost God, almost as good as Jesus, and had himself overestimated, why was he kicked out of heaven? Why didn't he stay and fight? Because he doesn't have the power, and the power will not be endowed him, regardless of what happens in that final conflict. Think of the irony. Your side wins, and you all still lose. That doesn't make sense. Neither does your stubborn insistence on winning. You cannot name one prophecy of the Bible, Old Testament or New, that has not been fulfilled exactly as it was foretold. Not one. And yet you have the audacity to tell me that when it comes down to the final moment in the history of natural man, a bunch of rebels from the last millennium will change everything. Sarsour stood and moved to a window, averting his eyes. He actually pulled back the curtains and raised the blinds. Abdullah had to stifle a laugh. How's the view? he said. From the basement. He looked past Sarsour to a wall of bricks. Beautiful day, isn't it? Sarsour turned quickly. Okay, all right, so I'm not as smart and articulate as you, and I can't frame my argument the best. Mudawar can. You should be debating him. Oh, friend, hear me. The problem with your argument is not you. It's simply that you're wrong. When I was raging against my wife, I was as prideful as you are. I sincerely believed she was wrong and that I could somehow bring her to her senses. I was angry. I was self-righteous, even as my life was flying out of control. Abdullah was overcome with emotion. His lips trembled and his voice grew thick. I was almost too late in seeing it myself. Imagine if I had been killed in the chaotic aftermath of the rapture. I'd have been lost forever. God granted me the grace to dig out my wife's letters and remind myself what she said. Sarsor, this is your chance. You won't get another. If you die at one hundred, there's no more hope for you. Sarsor returned to his seat and seemed to study Abdullah. Why does this trouble you so? Why don't you just leave me to my hopelessness, my wrongness, my, as you call it, foolishness? What am I to you? You're my friend. Ya Beck, I am your enemy. I disagree with everything you say. I mock your God. I accuse him. I hold him accountable. And I am instructed to love my enemy and to pray for those who spitefully use me. Sarsour shook his head. Talk about foolishness. I don't know what else to say to you, Sarsour. If you are so resolute... Abdullah carefully folded Yasmin's letter and began to tuck it back into his Bible. Oh, let me see that, Sarsour said, reaching for it. Abdullah, I believe, and I am certain you agree, that God hates divorce. It was not my intention that my new faith would result in the end of our marriage. This was your choice, but I concede that staying with you and allowing you influence over our children would have also been untenable as long as you feel the way you do about me now. I know this letter will anger you, and neither is that my intention. We have talked and talked about the differences between Islam and Christianity, but please indulge me and allow me to get my thoughts down in order. Hopefully God will help me make them clear. I do not expect that you will suddenly see the truth because of my words, but I pray that God will open your heart and will one day reveal himself to you. As I have said over and over, the difference between what you call our religions is that mine is not religion. I have come to believe that religion is man's effort to please God. I had always been bound by rules, acts of service, good deeds. I was trying as hard as I could to win the favor of Allah, 
so that in the end I would find heaven on earth. But I could never be good enough, Abdullah. And as wonderful as you were for many years, you couldn't either. That became clear with your unreasonable reaction to my coming to faith in the one true God and Father of Jesus Christ. To you it was anathema, despite the fact that, like me, you had drifted even from the tenets of Islam. I believe that to you my converting was a public humiliation. I regret that, but I could no more hide my true feelings and beliefs than I could ask you to give up flying. Just once more let me clarify. Christians believe the Bible teaches that everyone is born in sin and that the penalty for sin is death. But Jesus paid the price by living a sinless life and dying as a sacrifice for all who believe. Abdullah, you must admit you have never met a perfect person, and we each know the other is not perfect. We are sinners in need of salvation. We can't save ourselves, can't change ourselves. I am most encouraged by your discipline and your efforts. You are now more like the man I married. But don't you see? You will never be good enough to qualify for heaven because you would have to be entirely perfect. Some day, when you are ready, and I hope it will not be too late, just pray and tell God that you know that you are a sinner, that you are sorry and want to repent and be forgiven. Ask Him to take over your life. The day is coming, prophesied in Scripture, when Jesus will return in the clouds and snatch away all true believers in an instant, no one will see this happen except for those to whom it happens. Those left behind will simply realize that it is all true. Christians from all over the world will disappear. I hope it does not take a tragedy like that, though it will be anything but tragic for those of us who go, to get you to swallow your pride, examine yourself, and humble yourself before God. Of course, if this does happen before you come to true faith, you will know what has occurred, and you will be without excuse. I just pray that you do not lose your life in the resulting chaos before you can become a believer, not in a religion, but in a person, Jesus the Christ. With fond memories and deep affection, praying for you, Yasmin. Sarsour handed the document back to Abdullah. And so you did what she said? Became a believer? Abdullah nodded. And she and your children were gone? You didn't see them until they returned from heaven? My parents had reunions like that with their friends. Sarsour. Who could accomplish that? How could the evil one hope to prevail over a god like that? The young man pressed his lips together and shook his head. I have to get back to work, he said. We have a delegation coming from France in a few days. That's it then, Sarsour. The end of our discussion. It hasn't been a discussion, sir. It has been a sermon. Why waste your time here with just the two of us? Why are you not out preaching to the masses? There are a lot more undecided young people out there than in here, and they have to be more open-minded than we of the other light. We ought to know. They are our audience, our prospects. You are my prospects, Abdullah said. I am here in obedience to my Lord Christ, who knows best. Yekaterina was tearful at Kenny's news that he would be gone a few days to France. I wish I could go with you, she said. Me too. Pray for me while I'm gone. I pray for you all the time, love. Of course I will. I gave Ignace and Lothaire some very innocuous information about Cot. I merely told them where it was, how many children we hosted, how large the staff was— and that the big deal now had been the visits from biblical heroes. They were not impressed. Ignaz fired back a message that said, 
Tell us something we don't know. Tell us something that not everybody in the world knows. And tell us in person. I think he was really surprised when I told him I would be there tomorrow. I believe they were really starting to suspect me. You know what I miss, Bruce said late one night in the Negev as he and Rayford sat outside by a small fire. Darkness. The rest of the team slept in the massive trailer, heavy shades pulled against the daylight-like beaming of the moon. Rayford chuckled. You know what the Bible says about that? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Yeah, I think I was the one who taught you that, Ray. And yep, that's me. Evil. I know what you mean, though, Bruce. I'd love a starlit night to aid my sleep. But you've been to heaven where there is no night, not even shadow. Were you tired of it there? Bruce shook his head. Heaven is different, and I can't wait till the books are opened and all the believers go. As fascinating as this world and this kingdom are, I can't think they hold a candle to the next. They chatted long into the night, plotting the coming weeks of their mission. Bruce told Rayford of Kenny's call. Think of it, man. Who'd have ever thought I'd officiate your second wedding, your daughter's, and her son's? Chapter 25 Kenny had cleared several days off so he could complete his clandestine mission to Paris, but almost as soon as he got there, he heard from Yekaterina asking whether he could return and postpone his trip. Why? What's going on? Your father has just announced our next heroic visitor. Kenny, he's your favorite. Not David. The prince himself. I can't believe it. When? Within the next couple of days? I don't plan to return until Saturday. I know, that's why I'm saying maybe you could... But I prayed about this, sweetheart. I know this is where God wants me, and I have to think that if I make this sacrifice, he will somehow make it up to me. How? Who knows? Maybe by giving me an audience with David as he did my grandfather. I guess someday I'll have all the time I want with all the biblical characters. I know you're right, Kenny, and you've taught me that God favors obedience even over sacrifice. That's just hard for me right now because I was hoping this news would be enough to bring you back to me. I'll be back soon enough. Oh, and Kenny? This visit from David is different from all the others. We're not to tell anyone. You weren't even supposed to tell me? Well, you're on staff. But no kids, no parents, no friends. We've all been sworn to secrecy. That priest friend of your father's supposedly told him that if even one outsider shows up, the visit is off. And yet we don't even know when it is. Not exactly, no. Well, I'll bet old Kasim makes this one for sure. Actually, he's off the rest of this week, too. Abdullah knocked lightly on Mudawar's door. Yeah? He pushed it open slowly. Sorry to intrude. It's just that Sarsour mentioned perhaps a visiting delegation sometime soon, and... And you were wondering whether you should make yourself scarce? On the contrary... I wish to offer my services to them, too. If they are friends of yours, they are friends of mine, and I am eager to meet their needs. They don't have needs, Abdullah, and they aren't my friends. They are my bosses. More than that, they are my mentors, the ones who got me into this. The fact is, I idolize them and want to make a good impression, and right now... I can't imagine for the life of me how it's going to look if I have you ensconced in one of my offices. They're coming the day after tomorrow, and if you really want to help, I want this place sparkling by then. I am pleased to help. And then I want you out of here for a few days. No sign of you. Nothing left on your desk. That I will not do. Excuse me. You heard me, Mudawar. I repeat my pledge from the first. I am here under assignment from Almighty God. You may be under some illusion or delusion that you, in some moment of madness or genius, decided to allow me in. 
but the fact is the Lord has ordained it. You don't think I can kick you out of my own suite of offices? Oh, I know you can. But you also know that I would then be stationed in front of your door with my little table and my Bible and my smile, and I will be greeting your honored guests every time they enter or leave. And we both know people are somehow drawn to me. Yes, out of morbid curiosity. You're a relic, Abdullah, a peculiarity. Whatever it takes to attract a listening ear. Once I have their attention, I merely talk about the Lord. The rest is up to him, not this imperfect vessel. You are a crazy man. The Apostle Paul would have called me a fool for Christ. And so, what? It's either you in here making me look like an idiot before my mentors, or out by the front door being the dunce yourself? Either way it reflects upon you, I suppose. You have not consulted me in some time, though Sarsour has been at least cordial. That's what I'm afraid of. But a word to the wise. If I were you, I would represent my presence in your offices as your idea. A stroke of brilliance going against the grain, zigging when the rest of the world is zagging. If you can't persuade your mentors there's some benefit to the cause in this, that you have somehow convinced me that my time is better spent here than trying to persuade the same target audience, then perhaps you are not qualified for the role you have been given. Give it some thought. Kenny was in his Paris hotel room the next morning when he was informed of a message waiting for him at the desk. It read, Meet us at the address on the reverse, thirty minutes. I and L. The location was easy to get to by mass transit. Ignace and Lothair nodded at him from a wrought-iron table at an outdoor cafe as he crossed the street. Hey, guys, Kenny said, pretending not to notice that they didn't look happy. Just sit down, Ignace said. Who do you think you're kidding, anyway? I don't follow. You don't follow. You make noises at our cousin's funeral like you might be one of us. You string us along by email. We get absolute zilch from you, even though your buddy Kasim vouches for you with his life. And how hard do you think it was for us to figure out that your parents, your parents, started caught? And now you want us to believe you're sympathetic to the other light? Busted. What could he say? He breathed a silent prayer. Lord. What now? Take the offensive, he heard in his soul. Believe what you want to believe, Kenny said. But you'd better not have wasted my time dragging me all the way here just to tell me you don't trust me. There are plenty of people in other tall cells who do trust me. And as for where I'm embedded, where do you think you'd get better information? The brothers looked at each other, and Ignace nodded. Lothair pulled a computer printout from inside his jacket and looked around before setting it on the table. It listed every employee of Cot, their addresses and even their salaries. See what we can get without you, in spite of you? Fine, you've got a list you're not supposed to have, but it's not like it's highly classified. What can you do with it? You're going to start assassinating these people? You know they're invulnerable, even the naturals. Ignace leaned close, sighing and indicating that Lothair should put the print out away. The redhead stuffed it back into his pocket. Listen, we realize that sometimes the best we can do is to be nuisances. We want to access these kids, these younger minds. So far we've been targeting older kids, but your parents and all the people at Cot are brainwashing these innocents, and they'd never get a chance to hear the other side if it wasn't for us. In the meantime, we try to wreak havoc on the leadership, get their minds off their mission, give us a chance to move in, maybe provide an alternative. Now do you follow? Not really, but I suppose you've thought this through. Ignace looked over Kenny's shoulder and discreetly waved, summoning a young woman who looked strikingly like Cendrillon. Another cousin, Ignace explained. 
Nicolette, she said as she sat, her voice husky. A pleasure. Kenny greeted her noncommittally. She's going to tell you what's going on in some of the other places. Mexico, she said. Drugs, parties, alcohol. We spread the word quietly, and kids who feel oppressed by their parents, or by society, or by the church, come in droves. We get them on our mailing lists and go after them with intellectual arguments. You can't be serious. The three looked at Kenny with brows raised. There a problem, Williams? Inya said. Yeah, there is. You lure them with booze and drugs, and then you try to persuade them with reason? How reasonable can they be? How would you get to them? Start with the reason. Don't you respect your audience? Don't you want people with brains? At this rate, by the time we get to the last century of the millennium, you'll have a bunch of dopers and alkies trying to compete with the army of God. Get serious. That silenced them for a moment, but it was clear they didn't like being scolded. Well, Nicolette said, slowing and glancing at the brothers before proceeding, you're not going to like how we do it in Turkey. Pray tell. Hashish. Brilliant. You know, this is the best news that ever hit the other side. You might as well just concede, surrender, and hand over the future to the believers. It's going to be them against a bunch of doped-up losers at the final conflict. Wow, I wonder which way that's going to go. I thought the appeal of the other light was that you were all scholars, intellectuals. You'd thought this through, honestly come to a variant conclusion— and you wanted to keep other young people from being lemmings that follow their parents over a cliff. That's pretty much it, yeah, Ignaz said. Well, they may not fall off a cliff, but they're going to pass out. You got a better idea? Sure. Beat the believers at their own game. Raise up impressive, bright, humble young people who are a credit to society, but who disagree about the future. Wouldn't that be way more attractive to your potential recruits than thinking that this is all about getting away with illegal stuff? Lothair squinted at Kenny. But how do you do that? How do you reach them? How do we make our side appealing? It shouldn't be that hard. If you're right, you'll be convincing. And what you have going for you is the age of your audience. They're our ages. If they haven't become believers already... You know they're searching, wondering, thinking, wanting to use their brain power. They're going to be vulnerable to a message that goes against all the rest of society. There's glamour in being a revolutionary. Tap into that. The three sat as if thinking, and Ignace began to nod. You may be on to something, Lothair said. You know where they're doing this sort of... Jordan, Nicolette said. Those goofy-looking little guys in Amman. You're here till when, Williams? Saturday? Kenny nodded. Lothair and I were scheduled to drop in on them this week anyway. How about we all go? Maybe you can inspire them. I've never been to Jordan. Let's do it. At the end of the day, Mudawar called Abdullah and Sarsour together. All right, he said. Here's how it's going to work. When the top tall guys from Europe get here, we play it like this. I found Abdullah doing his thing on the streets, and he seemed effective. I gave him a cockamamie story about daring him to work with us and see who was most persuasive, and he bought it. Now that I've got him inside our little enclave, below ground, with precious little exposure to our audience, I've got him right where I want him. They're going to see it as a great idea, a model for other cells. I like it, Sarsour said. I don't, Abdullah said. But I did urge you to think about taking credit for me, and you are certainly planning to do that. One warning, no. I am incapable of perpetuating an untruth. Anyone asks me what I'm doing here, I'll tell them the truth of how it really came about.
Chapter 26 When David, the king of Jerusalem, and Jesus' prince, strode on to cot property, Cameron buzzed Chloe and they rolled into action. Word spread quickly throughout the staff that it was time to round up all the kids and get them in place. Greetings, greetings, David called out. Thanks for inviting me and for your attention. I have a most busy rest of the day at the temple, so let me get right into my story. It begins when I was the same age as many of you. It's unlikely that you can imagine what my life was like, but I had fun. Can you imagine tending sheep and fighting off wild animals? I don't know why God gave me the courage and the strength, but he did. Shepherds, you know, were the outcasts of society, and I often felt like an outcast among all my brothers until the Lord lifted me up. I was the youngest of eight boys growing up outside Bethlehem, but we were of lowly estate. Indeed, being a shepherd was the lowest occupation a lad or even a man could have. But I loved the Lord with all my heart, and I strove to please Him. I learned to play the harp and always played my best to honor my God. I also learned to be strong and brave and protect the sheep from wild beasts. I longed for the day when I could serve King Saul as my three oldest brothers did and fight in his army. Once our neighboring enemies, the Philistines, gathered their armies together for battle at Soho, which belonged to Judah. Saul and the men of Israel, including my brothers, were encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. Now picture this. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. A champion came out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. You know from hearing Noah's story how long a cubit is. Well, a span is about half a cubit, so in today's measures we would say Goliath was about nine feet nine inches tall. The children seemed to gasp as one. David laughed. Oh, believe me, I know how big he was, for I saw him, and I was still but a lad. He wore an immense bronze helmet and was armed with a coat of woven metal that weighed 125 pounds. I didn't weigh that myself at the time, and he wore bronze armor on his legs and carried a sword, a bronze javelin, and a spear with a head that weighed 15 pounds. He had a shield, too, but it was so huge that he had a man walk before him who carried it. Goliath cried out to the armies of Israel, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man and let him come down to me. If he is able to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I kill him... Then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, that was the talk of the whole of Israel, and everyone seemed to know that even Saul was dismayed and greatly afraid, for Goliath did this every morning and evening for forty days, and no one dared challenge him. One day my father told me to take an ephah of dried grain and ten loaves to my brothers at the camp. He also gave me ten cheeses to take to the captain of my brother's thousand men. My father said, See how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. So I rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the food and went as my father had commanded me. When I got there, the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. I left my supplies with the supply keeper, ran to catch up with the army, and greeted my brothers. While I was talking with them, that champion, the Philistine of Gath named Goliath, presented himself yet again and made his challenge. And all the men of Israel fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. The man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes. I couldn't believe my ears. Even though I was just a child, I said, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? 
Who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? My oldest brother heard this, and his anger was aroused against me. He said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Have you ever had your big brother or sister holler at you like that? I said, What have I done now? I turned toward others and said that no man should dare defy the armies of the living God. Well, someone reported this to Saul, and the king sent for me and asked me to explain myself. I said, Let no man's heart fail because of him. I will go and fight with this Philistine. The king told me, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But I said, I, your servant, used to keep my father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. I have killed both lion and bear. And this Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, Go, and the Lord be with you. He tried to clothe me with his own armor, but it was much too big for me. I took it off, took my staff in my hand, chose for myself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in my shepherd's bag with my sling. And I drew near to the Philistine. The children were dead silent, unmoving. So the giant came and began drawing near to me with his shield-bearer before him. Well, you can imagine what he thought when he saw me, a little red-faced boy. He said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And he cursed me by his gods. He said, Come to me! and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I said, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. When Goliath drew near, I ran to meet him. I reached into my bag and took out a stone. I slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that it sank in, and he fell on his face to the earth. I had defeated him without even a sword. The children clapped and cheered. I stood over him and drew his own sword out of its sheath and killed him, then cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. I took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and presented it to Saul. The children cheered again, but David quieted them. I have many stories I could tell, he said, of how King Saul eventually turned on me and hated me and tried to kill me, of his son Jonathan who became my best friend, of the time when I sinned greatly against the Lord and was abject in my sorrow and repentance until he forgave me. I was eventually crowned king of Israel, and late in my reign it came to pass that I was dwelling in my house, and the Lord had given me rest from all my enemies. I said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Later that night the Lord came to Nathan and told him to tell me not to build him a house for him to dwell in. 
He told Nathan to tell me, I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more, as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, and I will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him. Then the Lord told Nathan of me, Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. As you can imagine, I was overwhelmed. I went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Now, children, I want you to rise, and I want to teach you the proper way to worship the Lord God of hosts, Jehovah, Messiah. David reached toward heaven and lifted his face to the sky and said, now what more can I say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people? For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Now, O Lord God, let your name be magnified forever. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. With the merciful you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man you will show yourself blameless. With the pure you will show yourself pure. And with the devious you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. 
He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king, and shows mercy to his anointed, to me and my descendants forevermore. And when Cameron and the children and all the staff looked up from their prayer, David had disappeared from their midst. Chapter 27 Aside from having been born in the old United States of America and carted about by his globe-trotting parents during the tribulation, Kenny Bruce Williams had spent nearly all of his ninety-seven-plus years in Israel. Others he knew, especially his extended family, loved to travel. But he had never seen the appeal of being away from the very country in which the King of Kings and Lord of Lords physically resided and presided. On the other hand, despite the anxiety over working undercover, Kenny had found Paris interesting. None of the historical landmarks remained, of course, but attempts had been made to reproduce some of the more familiar, like the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, and even some of the great cathedrals. The prospect of going to Amman intrigued Kenny, if for no other reason than that his friends Bahira and Zaki had grown up there and had vague memories of the culture and the food. He didn't expect to experience much of either, but perhaps something in his travels would somehow find its way into his work with the kids at Cot. On the plane with Ignace, Lothair, and Nicolette, Kenny, for the first time, became aware of the stares and glares of people, mostly naturals, some glorifieds, who must have recognized the alternative clothing of the tallers for what it was. Kenny had known so little negativity in his life— of course, he barely remembered much of the tribulation, as it ended with the glorious appearing when he was still about four months shy of his fifth birthday, that it had been his practice to catch people's eyes, even strangers, and smile. That wouldn't do now. His pretend compatriots were rebels, misfits, outcasts. They kept to themselves, looking serious, or if they did meet someone's gaze, they proffered a hateful scowl. Kenny found that nearly impossible, so he just kept his eyes focused on the floor most of the time. Ignace, who sat next to Kenny, spent most of the 2,100-mile flight scribbling on papers he had apparently received from the leaders of various tall cells around the world. But every time Kenny glanced toward them, Ignace covered them and shot him a look. Finally, with about twenty minutes to go until touchdown, Ignaz packed up his stuff and leaned over. Here's the deal with Amman. We're fairly new there, so even though we've got two of our brightest recruits in that office, not much is happening. They use the name Theological Training Institute as their front, but free speech is virtually unheard of in Jordan, so these guys lie low and do most of their work over the Internet. They're building a database of people who are at least intrigued, so we want to find out how that's going. Truthfully, we had been steering them toward hosting secret parties where kids who are fed up or questioning the status quo can come and feel like they're really rebelling. We told Mudauer, he was a recruit for my own international blog and is our top guy there, really gifted, to offer them contraband stuff. But the more Lothair and I think about your idea, about taking the high road, the more sense it makes. I mean, I didn't sign up Mudauer, and he didn't sign up his assistant based on dope or booze or women or anything like that. Like you said, we appeal to their minds, and that is the kind of recruit we want. So once we're through with all the formalities and we get their progress report, you give them your pep talk, okay? Kenny nodded. This couldn't be worse. All he had intended with his little speech two days before was to allay their suspicions. He had done it so well he had inspired them to a better approach for recruiting. He sure didn't want to be responsible for their amassing a higher class of dissidents.
Cameron and Chloe sat in the office poring over employment records. Strange, Cameron said. You realize that this Kasim Marid has been gone all three times we had the Bible heroes here? Chloe leaned to look at the records. That's some coincidence, Cam. It's got to be more than that. What are the odds? It's almost like he doesn't want to be here when they are. But who wouldn't want to hear those guys? Hey, she said, what did you do with the master list? Which? The printout with all the staff names and addresses. You know I don't go into the files, Chloe. You've got it backed up on disk, right? Of course, but no one else is supposed to have access to the hard copy. Oh, Cam, we're not going to have to start putting locks on the doors, are we? Not after almost a hundred years with no mischief. Abdullah was amused by Mudawar and Sarsour. For the first time since he had met them, they looked clean and tidy. Oh, Mudawar was still oily. It was as if he couldn't help that. But his hair was combed and his fatigues, like Sarsour's, were clean and crisp. They had spent the entire previous afternoon cleaning up the offices, and now they scoured the suite, making sure they hadn't missed a thing. Every sheet of paper tacked to the wall hung square. Every stack of books or papers was neat and straight. Abdullah knew he had endeared himself even more to them by helping with the cleanup. A suggestion, he said. Sure, what, Mudawar said. You don't want it to look artificial. I mean, you want your mentors to believe you actually work here, right? Yeah, so? We're not going to slop it up just so it looks lived in. No, I'm just saying that when they arrive, you shouldn't be standing around like you're posing for school pictures. You should be on your way to or from some important project. Good idea. Look alive when they get here, Sarsor. Don't act like you've got nothing else to do. But I don't. What's more important than entertaining them? Just look busy. And you, old man, I haven't decided exactly what to say about you yet, so blend into the woodwork unless spoken to. Understood? Another young man and young woman, whom Ignaz identified as tall operatives from Azarka, northeast of Amman, picked up the Jospin brothers, Nicolette and Kenny at the airport in a plain white van. Kenny was struck by how the colleagues greeted each other. He detected no warmth or enthusiasm. It was all business. By the way, Kenny said, I might as well head straight back to Israel from here. I'm not much more than forty miles away. What would be the best way to get there? The driver said, I can run you there. We have business in Beersheba anyway. Really? Kenny said. Another cell? The only one in Israel. They're pretty squirrely about it, as you can imagine, right there in enemy territory. Well, you can drop me close to my home, but needless to say, I can't draw any attention to myself. That goes double for us, the driver said. We'll just drop you where you tell us. When Abdullah heard the loud knock, he and Mudawar and Sarsour immediately rushed to the TV monitor to get a look at the visitors. There are the brothers, Mudawar said, and that must be the girl they've told me about. I don't recognize the others. Should I open it? Sarsour said. Take a breath, man, Mudawar said. Don't look too anxious. Abdullah froze. What could he do? Where could he hide? Unless his eyes were deceiving him, that was Cameron and Chloe's son, Kenny. What could this mean? He rushed back to his desk, swept his Bible and papers and other personal effects into his bag, and moved quickly to the front door. When Sarsour opened it, Abdullah stepped behind it, and as the others were going through the introduction formalities, he slipped out. He bounded up the stairs to the street and headed back to his apartment, fearful beyond all reason. Minutes later, he was pacing in the small place, with Yasmin pleading with him to sit down. I can't, he said. I cannot. I have known that precious boy since he was born. What am I supposed to do with this information? Ask his parents? Or would I be telling them? You had better be certain first, Abdullah. You have no doubt? It was him, all right. I caught a live glimpse of him, too, and heard his voice. There is no question. 
Strange. It's worse than strange, Yasmin. It's catastrophic and has dire implications. Ask Bahira and Zaki. They're his friends. Abdullah reached the message systems of both kids' phones, informing him they would return his call at the end of their workdays. Yasmin, what was the name of that infiltrator? He will know. Perhaps Kenny is in league with him. Yes, that has to be it. Yasmin dug around until she found the contact information for Kasim Marid. Abdullah phoned. I have a very delicate question for you, Master Marid. Is there another infiltrator from Millennium Force? Kasim sounded wary. An infiltrator where? You tell me. Within Tall, of course. Why do you ask? Of whom are you speaking? Sir, please, if you know, just tell me. Well, first I must swear you to secrecy. From whom? From everyone. Your friends, even your children. May I count on you for that? If it will ensure the safety of the person in question, certainly. I have your word you'll speak of this to no one until further notice? Yes, yes, of course. We, shall I say, had another infiltrator, yes. What a relief. Was it... Please, do not mention names other than in person. The bad news is that this infiltrator I have just learned has turned. Turned? He is full-fledged tall now. He has entirely bought into their philosophies. Oh, no. It is sad but true, sir. I am in the midst of damage control now. All I can do is all I can do, and I must tell you that you are aware of this is a great complicator. Please reassure me that you will not share this information with a soul until you hear back from me. Abdullah could barely speak. You have my word, he managed. The Amman office of the other light looked efficient enough, Kenny decided, even if the occupants seemed quirky. For as bright as Ignace had made them out to be, they seemed obsequious. The top guy, the pudgy Mudawar, acted the sycophant around Ignaz, having to stop and catch his breath, he spoke so quickly. Ignaz had paused during the tour and stared at a clean desk in the back of the third room. Someone work here, he said. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, no, no one. Well, sometimes if we have special projects, you know. I've been known to work here if I need room to spread out, and you have too, haven't you, Sarsor? What? Worked here, right here where this extra space is. We like to keep it free for, you know, you have, right? Worked here? Not in a long time. Not since, well, I settled in there recently for one of my all-night newsletter writing stints. And I know Sarsour has worked there, too. At least he used to, before. Recently. Finally, Ignace's entire entourage crowded into Mudawar's office, some in chairs, some sitting on the desk, others leaning against the wall. Ignace asked Mudawar to give them an update on their recruit list and strategy, then reminded him that Kenny here is one of our only two operatives embedded near Jerusalem. We've got real potential for a cell in Beersheba, but that's going to take time. Kenny has interesting recruitment ideas I wanted him to outline for you, not because you need it, necessarily, and certainly not because you've been doing it wrong. If anything, you've been going about this better than we have, and we didn't even know it until Kenny pointed it out. Mudower was beaming. Really? Yes. Kenny? Well, I was just mentioning to Ignace and the others that it seems to me the best strategy for recruiting the young disaffected of our world isn't through this bait-and-switch technique of luring them to parties and illicit activities and substances. We want them for their minds, and so that is where we ought to be aiming. Within minutes, everyone was furiously taking notes, and Kenny was having a major crisis of conscience. He knew he had to keep this up to avoid giving himself away, but he would never forgive himself if his counsel had the effect tall so desired building a better, smarter network of brighter adherence.